morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. And uh, thank you for sitting in on this session. Um, the primary objective of the first session is just to sort of set the backdrop for the rest of the day. So what we'll try and do is cover topics uh, with broad brush strokes. Probably don't have enough time to go really deep on several of the uh, issues that might come up in this discussion. But uh, we're fortunate to have with us today uh, two uh, CEOs of uh, very, two very successful franchises in healthcare. And also we have uh, Raj with us. Fidelity has been investing in this space for several years. <clears throat> so it'd be interesting to get uh, perspectives from two operators of the business and uh, two of us bring the investor's perspective. Um, a request to the audience, uh, please write down your questions and send them up. There are a bunch of folks on the side, I think, who will uh, who've been instructed to collect all your questions and we'll try and get as many as them uh, answered. So let me start by uh, directing the first question at uh, Vishal and, and Rajan. <clears throat> so from the perspective of an operator, uh, what opportunities look exciting? Broad question, but let's see where this takes us. <laughs> right, okay. Three to four areas which uh, I can see. Uh, one clearly is the urbanization that's taking place and I think for the healthcare industry, that is really very exciting. Um, you, you do have uh, the urban centers today, uh, which are fairly well provided. Uh, but uh, what I see going forward is the opportunities that one would get in the tier two, tier three towns. Uh, but even in the uh, urban centers, uh, let's say for, that is clearly an opportunity that we see um, uh, uh, there. Along with this is the fact that the whole healthcare spend is, is increasing. And, we, we know that today uh, it's around 8% of uh, household incomes and uh, in the next uh, 10, 15 years, we're talking in terms of it growing to about 13, 14%. So uh, clearly you can see uh, the, the interest in, in, in uh, healthcare uh, and uh, interest in, in the spend in healthcare uh, taking place. Uh, and the third, of course, is the fact that um, uh, you have uh, increasing coverage. Um, earlier you, you heard about the fact that 25% uh, of, the, of the population is covered. But I think the interesting thing there is the fact that that 25% has come over a very short period of time. Um, we're talking in terms of actually 25 to 30%, 40 crores of our people are covered by some insurance or the other, whether it is corporate, community, state, government, or central government. Uh, and, and that has really uh, happened in the last five to 10 years. So uh, we can see increasingly more and more people getting covered under insurance. And that's again, a very exciting uh, opportunity for the healthcare sector. Uh, and the last, of course, is that uh, there are, that there's a move from uh, going from traditional models of multi-speciality to single speciality uh, and newer kind of uh, uh, models which are being experimented. Some are working, some uh, have their own challenges, but clearly the willingness to look at these uh, and uh, the uh, Indian uh, healthcare patient population also willing to look at these uh, is something which uh, offers a great opportunity. Thanks, Rajan, and uh, <laughs> pleasure to be here again. So a couple of things, uh, Hari, from, uh, from an operator lens uh, and uh, to see what could be the potential opportunities and al also what operators would generally like to see in, a, in the very new world of healthcare that is emerging in India right now. Um, you know, Rajan talked about a couple of things. To me, uh, I think the number one area uh, certainly comes from the perspective of that there are still many clinical specialties which are highly underpenetrated in our country. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, you know, the, the growth segment of certain diseases, uh, many of our players have been chasing the same set of specialties for a long period of time. Uh, but there are the confluence of new technology which is creating the opportunity to make new specialties probably more viable than what they have been in the past. Uh, is, is a great opportunity, um, you know, oncology being one of the key ones. And, um, you know, while there are a couple of players who have taken some early, uh, early moves in that specialty, but I think looking at that disease segment and what it would evolve to, I think that's a, from an operator lens, that seems to be one of the uh, biggest areas that uh, one would like to see. I think the other one which from an operator perspective uh, is becoming critically important is 
we still run healthcare from 19th century management principles, right? And, um, and I think one of the key determinants of success from an operator lens has to be uh, imbibing new management principles into running healthcare enterprises. Uh, and I think that there's a big lacuna over there in terms of, uh, and again, uh, since we are sitting in an investor-driven conference, I think that's, that's clearly uh, how do we professionalize this sector faster? How do we create uh, more productivity? And how do we create uh, a lens which probably sees the sector very differently than what it has in the past is going to make a lot of difference. I think the third one very clearly is, uh, while new formats have been emerging, I think uh, how these formats will work together uh, and confluence together is very critical because uh, traditionally the sector has sort of followed a, a process by way of which uh, everybody jumps into the same uh, categories uh, all together. And, and then over a period of time, it's literally all about scale. And the more scale you create, probably the survival depends on the scale. But I, the way that I see it, that how can we sort of, from an operator lens, bring a lot of these new entrants together while they continue to get their growth trajectory and, and one should help them to sort of deliver on their growth trajectory. But how do we sort of uh, create an opportunity which is more collaborative in nature? so that not all the investments from everybody is going down the same stream, but we are able to sort of channelize many of these investments in new opportunities. And from an operator lens, again, um, that creates a better sector for the future. So this clearly to me are, um, are three different buckets that one would like to look at. And, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, as the sector evolves, there'll be, there are exciting new things which are happening in this space particularly from the Indian context, and, uh, and not just from the Indian context, from the Asian context. And one would at some given point in time also try to bridge all these pieces together from a much larger geographical perspective and see how it can work really together, uh, again, from an operator viewpoint. Promoters and operators, by definition, are optimists, right? And in investors, by experience, have become skeptical. So the next question is for Raj. So, Raj, from your point of view, what are some of the key challenges that you see uh, that could hamper the growth of this industry? Thank you, Hari, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, I, our view of the world is uh, the healthcare industry, just given the nature of its offerings, um, is going to change uh, pretty profoundly in India uh, over the next few years. And, um, and I, I, I think there are, as, as investors um, and practitioners, there are uh, two or three areas that um, I think we should all um, really uh, be observing and watching out for. Uh, number one, I think this industry, unlike a lot of the other industries like telecom or, uh, or, or, or power or infrastructure, will get progressively more regulated than less. Uh, I think the amount of scrutiny that this uh, industry uh, will have uh, an oversight from regulators is I think only going to increase. Um, Again, tying back to the, the, uh, the, the sort of the kind of offering that this uh, sector has, um, you're already starting to see some of those elements creep in. You're starting to see pricing control uh, in, in pharma, uh, and I think uh, that trend is only going to go in one direction in our view. Uh, you are starting to see uh, f far greater scrutiny from um, uh, institutions like um, uh, the FDA on uh, quality of manufacturing. Um, unannounced visits and the like, uh, and I think you will see uh, a lot more of that happening, uh, that which will put pressure uh, on uh, manufacturing practices and eventually will, uh, will drive up costs. Um, you are going to start seeing uh, a little bit more scrutiny on uh, sales practices um, and, and hospital billing practices and the like, which is all things that I think uh, we should be prepared of. And part of this drive will also come from I think how the payer system will evolve. I think, I think India has been obviously very different from a lot of the other markets because it's still predominantly private pay. Um, but as insurance companies here uh, get more people under coverage as that transition happens, uh, which I think it will, um, you will see another stakeholder uh, who will have a dog in the fight and, uh, and, and will want to have their say. So I think that's the other thing that we, we really need to watch out for. Um, 
and, uh, and, and finally, I would say, uh, just again, the industry, given the nature, I think, you know, makes for great headlines. I think if you have quality issues um, in, uh, in, in manufacturing, I think they tend to grab headlines. Um, you know, we spoke about sales practices. I think you're starting to see what's happening to some of the multinationals in China. Uh, you know, is that something that could happen in India? I think that's a question I think we should all be asking ourselves. Uh, so, uh, and then f the final point I would also make is um, from the government's perspective, uh, I think they're trying to balance and, and, and juggle multiple things. This is not just about investors maximizing profits or, or, or entrepreneurs and business people maximizing profits. Uh, I think these regulations are probably going to increase, and I think not all of it is bad. I think uh, it's, it's, a lot of them are probably for the right reasons, which are, again, tied to um, how the government is trying to uh, have a little bit of a, a greater control on the, on the healthcare industry. Um, and so, uh, you know, things like um, uh, FDI and, and, and FIPB and, and what are they going to continue allow, allowing to, um, uh, to be bought and sold, uh, are things that I think uh, will also probably going to become increasingly difficult. So, uh, you know, I'm just cutting across a, a whole bunch of issues, but these are things that as investors and entrepreneurs we should be aware of. I, I don't necessarily think there are obstacles, but I think this is how the industry will evolve. And I think as we are looking at opportunities, uh, these are the boundary conditions that need to be kept in mind. So, Assuming that you cannot count on Government of India to actually be an enabler here, and you can actually reasonable reasonable to conclude that you can actually count on them to be a hindrance. Um, you mentioned, uh, Rajan, about opportunities in tier two, tier three towns and cities. Um, uh, Vishal, you mentioned about you know, several exciting new technologies that are coming out there. All of this costs capital. And Raj has just outlined a whole bunch of challenges. So how do you put this together? Uh, because, you know, uh, somebody has to fund the growth. Uh, there's an expectation of return on capital employed. And then, obviously, you can, for certain, expect government of India to sort of put hurdles in your way. Uh, how do you intend to achieve your growth plans or at least tap into that potential that you articulated uh, a few minutes ago? So, Hari, I think, um, you know, uh, we, uh, we've constantly been... Uh, grappling with the idea and um, and I think the general thinking has and the past thinking has always been that uh, healthcare investments uh, you know do not necessarily give the kind of returns that many other sectors uh, promise to investors the fact of the matter that you know all the people in sitting in this room combined together have pumped in more than a billion dollars in healthcare over the last uh, year year and a half just fundamentally shows that the metrics are finally emerging. So there, there are players out there who have returned value. And, uh, and of, of course, that value enhancement will continue to happen more and more as uh, we begin to refine the sector further. I think the macroeconomic situation of healthcare in terms of uh, why we believe that healthcare will continue to be a good long-term story. You know, you definitely cannot look at healthcare investments from the same lens as one sees technology investments. You know, um, a five-year window, uh, which is the typical lens that one looks at, has to be broadened a little further, and uh, probably to a seven to a nine-year kind of a window. And that's when you will see returns coming in more because of the very nature of this sector, uh, you know, large capital outlay up front, uh, the need for consistent capital to be deployed back because of the technology enhancements that are required. And I think that's where it also becomes very critical to see what is uh, the optimal size of the facilities that we are putting in. And even as the new models begin to emerge and begin to come in, uh, what really matters is to have the right investment up front. You know, this sector has traditionally uh, over-invested up front. Right? And, and that's what really creates many issues. So if one is able to sort of put the right metrics of investments in place, the right model in terms of, uh, you know, we've all been very fond of putting up 450 and 500 bedded hospitals. Uh, does that space continue to exist? Or do we need to now look at 150 and 200 beds as the optimal size? And uh, would that make more sense over a long period of time and then continue to expand them 
to become 500 and 600 beds as time evolves. So I think there is, there is a level of refinement which has begun to come in and uh, many of us who have been part of the sector for a long period of time understand the play that this requires refinement on a consistent basis. And I, and I see no reason as to why uh, all investments will do well because you can't go wrong in healthcare in India. It is, it's a fundamental truth. You just cannot go wrong with healthcare in India. Uh, let, let me add to what uh, Vishal has said and let me take one of the points that uh, he was talking of. This whole issue of sizing uh, of the hospital and I think uh, that is something that we uh, are presently seized with and I agree with Vishal to the, to the extent that you know, we're not really talking in terms of 600 bed, 500, 600 bed anymore. Because uh, going back to my first point, when you're talking in terms of urbanization and uh, we find quite a few surveys which talk of patients uh, one of the critical uh, 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 requirements for a patient experience is in terms of how close they are to a good facility. So we can actually see in an urban setting, uh, hospitals which are 200 uh, to 250 beds, uh, at the most 300 beds, coming up uh, or dotting across uh, various locations. So I think we are all gearing around to the fact that yes, that, that is probably the ideal sort of size that, that you need to do uh, when you're talking in terms of setting up. Uh, but the issue that I think we all face uh, is that if you have to make an investment in healthcare, you need to take a medium-term view on that. It cannot be a short-term view. Uh, and the reason is that the whole uh, healthcare market has changed from being single hospital uh, to now a network of hospitals. And, and if one has to grow, uh, and, and that's where the corporate uh, networks are, are looking at, uh, we are talking in terms of having uh, multiple uh, uh, hospitals across not just a region, but across uh, multiple regions. Uh, and when you start looking at that, uh, you are really talking in terms of having a mix of established, uh, stable uh, hospitals versus new greenfields, uh, which are also a part of that portfolio. And when you talk of the kind of returns that you, that, that you need to get on an average, uh, the the fact that you have these green fields depressing the average sort of returns is a factor that needs to be taken into account. So, therefore, I think uh, when we are talking in terms of getting a, a reasonable sort of uh, return in terms of the investments that you make, uh, it is essential that if you need to really build up that network, you need to look at it from uh, being there for a, a certain uh, medium you know, period of time. Uh, uh, Hari, I'm just going to add to that, and I, 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 I agree with b both what, uh, what Vishal and Rajan mentioned. I think to Vishal's uh, point in particular uh, that you, you cannot ignore the healthcare industry in India. I, you know, I, I laid out a bunch of macro issues that I think all of us should be watchful of. Um, but if you, if you take, uh, you know, the objective of making healthcare more um, uh, accessible, uh, bringing down the overall uh, cost of healthcare, and making investments or backing companies or starting companies that are profitable, um, I don't think they're necessarily at cross purposes with each other. Um, I think, uh, you know, we will have to evolve um, uh, and, and, and healthcare industry where uh, you are starting to see uh, more innovation in business model, the type of things you do. Um, and, and if you look at each of the constituencies, be it med tech and med devices, be it pharmaceuticals, um, um, or, uh, or, or, or any of the hospital consumables, um, how do you really bring down uh, the overall cost of each of these aspects? Uh, how are you promoting more domestic manufacturing? Um, how are you setting up a, uh, a, a sort of format that really works for India, especially as you go to tier two, tier three towns to the point that, that Rajan mentioned? Uh, and so I think in a lot of ways, the, the opportunity here you know, becomes you know, what I would call a micro opportunity. I think if you look at it from a broad macro perspective, you can see you know, challenges, headwinds, more regulation, et cetera. Uh, but I think when you peel the onion and you go a couple of levels deeper, uh, at least what we have noticed is there's a whole bunch of very exciting, interesting things that are happening where people are taking these boundary conditions and saying, okay, how do I create a profitable company uh, within that? Uh, and I think those opportunities are there and I think that's what we, we ought to be watching out for. So. So there's a question from the audience, very specific question. Um, uh, is there a case for a standalone super specialty network of dental centers? And uh, can they expect to be funded or would they be interesting to uh, venture capitalists, private equity 
from a funding point of view. So I think it's addressed to all three of you. So maybe we could start with you, Raj, and then from the large behemoth healthcare delivery platforms of Manipal and Fortis, uh, how do you see that emerging and evolving? You know, I think uh, our view is if the business model is executed right, I think, I think you could uh, grow it into something. You know, I would say 10 years ago, if you ask, is there really a case for uh, large ophthalmology chain, I think a lot of it might have been skeptical, uh, but now you've seen, you know, um, you know, 25 of those companies backed by, you know, 30 investors. Um, uh, now, is that too much? That's a separate issue, but, but I think there is a case to be built that in each of these things. The unit economics of each of these things uh, will be different, so the, the unit economics of a dental chain will probably be different from an ophthalmology chain or from a nephrology center. Uh, but can somebody get the model right? Can it be executed right? Um, I think uh, the chances of that is yes. You know, we have an investment in a company called Trivitron. One of the subsidiaries they have is a, uh, is, is a dental chain um, a joint venture with the, with the Apollo Hospital. Early days, uh, but I, th you know, I think, again, if that model is executed right, I think uh, it's got legs. So, so um, you know, we've had a great experience in dentistry. and. Um, in the early 2011, we invested in a company in Australia, New Zealand called Dental Corp, um, Australia, New Zealand's largest dentistry network. Uh, when we invested in that company, there were about 135 dentistry sites between Australia and New Zealand. And um, we actually exited that company uh, end of 2012 when we had grown it to 195 uh, dentistry sites in Australia, New Zealand. Uh, EBITDA margins were 28%. Uh, the reason why we exited on it was basically because the Australian economy and, uh, you know, the way that things were heading over there because dentistry is highly consumer driven and uh, even in, in other parts of the world. So I'm a firm believer of the fact that uh, these are the really new models and that's, what I, that's exactly what I was trying to say that many of our specialties and many of the clinical areas are, pro are under penetrated today. And dentistry is probably one of them. Um, when consumerism grows, uh, dentistry is one of those specialties that grows with it. And we are seeing it happen. Uh, many of us look at it with a lens of uh, cosmetic dentistry and things like that, but not necessarily so. You have an aging population and so uh, as, as you begin to age, probably dentistry is the only science in one's life which goes throughout your lifetime unlike any other specialty in healthcare. From the time that you're a child to the time that you're a geriatric adult, if there is one person who stays with you across your lifetime, it's a dentist. And just, just think about it for a minute and you will, you will get the answer. No other medical specialist lasts your lifetime. So if that is the case, can you really go wrong in that specialty? The question is, what is the kind of model that you put around it? And what, uh, what kind of uh, structure you put around it because dentistry by virtue of uh, that specialty is very entrepreneur driven and uh, you know so it's fundamentally the way that I looked at it from our Australian ex uh, experience was trying to put together 195 entrepreneurs together and it worked very well so uh, that's the thought I would like to leave behind. Uh, can I? Uh, let, let me just try and extend that. We are not into dental at all. Uh, our positioning is very different. We are multi-speciality. Uh, but if one were to take that question in terms of spe single speciality, I think another factor that needs to be kept in mind is the Indian mindset. Uh, you know, there are certain uh, disciplines, models, which have been very well accepted. And maybe that's also because of the fact that, uh, you know, uh, they have been, it has been successfully uh, uh, implemented under a trust structure and, and now extended to a corporate structure like ophthalmology, for instance. And similarly, I can see that with respect to dental, where the acceptance from the Indian patient population is, is much more. Uh, but if you take single specialities in other areas, uh, the success rate is not so much. For instance, uh, day surgery, uh, for instance, uh, or even uh, uh, birthing centers. Uh, what we see happening there is actually uh, tweaking of these models to suit the Indian requirements, where you have day surgeries now also having inpatients, where you have birthing facilities, pure birthing facilities, also moving into pediatrics, uh, NICU, and, and, and you know, uh, high-end uh, 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 surgeries. So um, I think one needs to see how well accepted these would be in the Indian patient uh, mindset, and, and then uh, you know, look at that uh, in, a, in a much more careful way.
And Hari, I'll just add a final point to that. I mean, I spoke about unit economics, and I think just tying back to a point uh, Vishal made, it's, uh, you know, dentistry is obviously highly underpenetrated. Uh, so the first challenge is to get, you know, patients in to come and see a dentist. Uh, you will then, ha you know, you'll probably have a lot of uh, the patients coming in for a regular cleanup. Uh, and look, that's not where you're going to make the real money. Eventually, I think a lot of the money is, is going to be made here, again, from a unit economic standpoint, where you're doing some of the procedures around root canal or you're trying to, um, you, you know, not even just your regular fillings, uh, but if you're getting into the orthodontics and, and, and other stuff. And I think it'll take time. So if anyone is trying to get into this business with saying, look, in, a, in three or four years, can I create something that's incredibly profitable? I don't think that is the case. This is, like a lot of other things with healthcare delivery in India, just a longer gestation period. Uh, but eventually, um, it, can, can it be a profitable model? I think the answer is yes. Thanks, Raj. <clears throat> so the next question is on behalf of all the entrepreneurs out there who've got this brilliant idea for a, for a very innovative healthcare delivery model. And um, what we found uh, in the last at least 18 to 24 months, uh, Rajan and Vishal, is that we have all these very innovative, nimble new entrants who are coming up with these low cost, uh, low capital intensive delivery models. Daycare, uh, like outpatient surgical centers, uh, birthing centers, right? And then they're being crowded out by the large healthcare providers like Apollo Fortis who come with their big checkbooks and their appetite for long gestation periods. And um, uh, so what's your view on uh, this dynamic? I mean, will this therefore stifle the growth of these innovative new entrants who are bringing in you know, new innovative low-cost delivery models or uh, they will survive and there's hope and they should continue to try? Uh, so, good, good one, Hari. I think, um, you know, this, uh, the old phenomena of the big fish wanting to eat all the smaller fishes uh, I don't really think that's going to be true anymore. Um, I think it's important that, uh, number one, even the bigger players um, are now recognizing very clearly where to play and how to play, right? And if you get that definition right in terms of even as a big player, do you really necessarily be needing to be out there in every segment that, that is there in healthcare? Uh, the answer is definitely not 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 yes for everything. So I think there is a great opportunity and as one is seeing over there, uh, it's, it's also about, uh, you know, in entrepreneurship, it's also about trying to create something which lasts a lifetime. Now, if there are entrepreneurs out there who are looking at exiting their businesses in five years and six years, then it's not necessarily the bigger players who are going to come and take them, but uh, it's going to be many other formats of investments which are going to come in. So I think it's a question of being able to stick on to your model and create something for a much, much longer term period. And I think each one of these segments that is emerging today has a great lifetime. So whether it's um, the single specialty maternity centers that are coming up, um, you know, the entire ophthalmology chains that one is talking about today. Uh, we are talking about primary healthcare and uh, long-term uh, primary healthcare clinics. I think each one of them uh, has a lifetime of their own and do not necessarily need to be taken up by the bigger players. And, and I actually uh, do not see the necessity as to why the bigger players would want to go after all this because these are not necessarily the formats that the bigger players would want to, uh, to, to chase all the time. Maternity has been a, a key driver for many of the multi-specialty hospitals, but do you want to have 200 of your beds filled up with maternity care when you have so much of your investments lying in many of the other specialties? The answer is no. So, so I think the question therefore is that each one of these new verticals and new formats that's coming up has a lifetime of their own and we should let them live that lifetime. You know, our uh, assessment or experience has been slightly different. You know, I, I think eventually, uh, you know, some, maybe not all, but some of the operators are going to try to maximize the revenues that they can get. Um, you are therefore starting to see hospitals that are progressively, um, you know, there's no reason why they need to be in the pharmaceutical business, but, you know, if the patient is going to spend on, on drugs, you know, why don't I capture it? Um, you know, and, and likewise for, for labs and likewise for imaging. 
I think one of the other things that is going to drive this change is once you start having uh, a, a greater uh, penetration of healthcare IT. Uh, you know, we haven't spoken about that, but I think, you know, if you look at, um, by and large, a lot of the hospitals in India, uh, the, the technology is incredibly rudimentary in terms of information technology, how they keep patient records and how do they deal with that. And I think over time, as you start seeing more and more of that coming in, where they try to really keep the patient across the life, just like you know, uh, a dentist like to keep the, the patient through, uh, through his or her entire life, uh, you would see uh, hospitals trying to say that, look, how do I keep that patient for whatever you know, the, the demands are? Is there a way for me to try to, uh, try to capture that? So I think there, is going, there are going to be some players who are going to try to, try to play that. You're starting to, you, you already see some examples of that where, uh, where you have some of the larger franchises who are, want to be in everything from ophthalmology to dentistry to have their own on, on drug chains and, 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 and likewise. So, uh, but it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. And I think um, uh, healthcare IT is going to play, in, play an important role in this evolution. So, yeah. Vishal, uh, you mentioned this fascinating case study in Hong Kong, right? Uh, so extending that, uh, what lessons can the entrepreneurs here and the folks who are in finance learn from delivery models that you see are successful in other countries? So, um, Hari, I've been actually very fortunate over the last two, three years um, to look at almost 11 countries uh, where Fortis has gone and made its investments. And you see some remarkable healthcare delivery models in many of the other countries, uh, whether, you know, we talked about dentistry in Australia, New Zealand, uh, one would least expect in a developed world kind of an economy, uh, you would see an asset growing 15, 18% on the top line and, and returning margins of, uh, you know, margins of 28 odd percent. Similarly, in, in Hong Kong, uh, you know, we run Hong Kong's largest primary healthcare network. Uh, 300 odd clinics uh, across the length and breadth of Hong Kong. And again, an asset uh, in a developed world, kind of like Hong Kong, growing at uh, double digit uh, margins, uh, growing double digits. So I think there are these examples which exist in various countries. And one has to have the ability to scan through uh, and see as to what to pick up and what not. I think just replicating these models will not be enough, but studying and ensuring that these models are out there. Um, you know, we, we, we recently divested um, uh, a healthcare chain, a hospital chain that we had acquired in Vietnam, uh, which was giving us 28% margin um, and an asset which was growing 40% year on year six hospitals in Vietnam. A great country, great opportunity. The question therefore is that in each one of these lessons uh, lies a particular area of healthcare delivery which mattered to that environment and to that geography at that given point in time. And these models have sort of evolved over a long period of time in many of these countries. I think picking up these models and bringing them over here um, is a great idea. Um, I know that some of the nephrology chains that we are currently seeing emerge in the country, uh, the daycare <coughs> nephrology chains, the U.S. has sort of built great models. Of, you know, Davita has done such a fantastic job of uh, dialysis centers in the United States. So I think there are, and within Asia, we find almost in every country a new definition of a, of a model existing. And, uh, and one has to have the ability to just scan through the entire region and see what has worked where and bring up those which can be viable in the Indian, in the Indian environment. The fact that we are still largely payer driven out of pocket actually will only help us in creating many of these models faster. These models have evolved in many other countries through a very different payment mechanism. But the fact that we are still very cash driven in terms of consumption is actually going to make many of these models much more viable in our environment than what it has been in, in the other countries. Um, we, we don't have any um, experience in terms of operating abroad, but we made our first investment in Malaysia. Uh, and and uh, we are looking at uh, areas such as uh, Africa, South Africa, uh, Middle East. But I think what, uh, uh, what, is, what is driving that is also the fact that the price points overseas are much better uh, compared to uh, maybe the Indian context. So. Uh, as a private e equity investor, uh, if you're looking at uh, having a mix, a good sort of mix of uh, overseas investments and uh, uh, Indian investments, I think the experience would be uh, uh, fairly, fairly good. 
So from that point of view, clearly we have a strategy to look at not just expansion within the country, but also expansions in cer certain select uh, locations overseas uh, where, where we can get fairly good price points compared to the uh, Indian market. Thanks, folks. Uh, <clears throat> looks like we're out of time. Um, so just to summarize, uh, firstly, thank you all for spending your time with us. Um, it sounds like um, you know, our panelists here are very optimistic. Despite the best efforts of the government to be in the way, they feel that uh, exciting times lie ahead. Uh, increasing coverage of insurance, uh, higher healthcare spending, newer delivery models finding acceptance amongst Indian patients, uh, many specialties underpenetrated and uh, with innovations in technology and delivery models makes it uh, more attractive. Um, room for everyone. So for those of you out there in the audience who have thought of the next big idea in delivery, uh, please be at it. And uh, I think Raj is uh, very optimistic about the prospects of these models. So from a funding point of view, it shouldn't be a problem. So with that, uh, we'll bring this session to a close. Thank you very much.